Welcome back to Art Astro Amber Astrology. Um, I don't know if anyone knows, but that's my email. Um, so you can email me on Art Astro Amber Astrology if you uh, want a personal reading um, or just like maybe identify her on your natal chart or a personal reading and blah, 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 whatever. Um, so today I'm just going to tap into the uh, meaning of all of the houses from 1 to 12 and what they mean to me and how I interpret them within my astrology and how I do my astrology readings within all of the 12 houses. So, all right, I'm just going to delve deep. All right, house one. Now, all we need to think about when we think about houses is what planet rules the houses, what sign rules the houses, and what area of life rules the houses. So once we get the house, planet, and area of life all down into place, we remember all of our 12 houses quite easily. All right, and once this is down, then we can really start tapping into like how to understand astrology and how to read for ourselves, how to read our own natal chart, how to read our own sinistry chart, how to read our own composite chart. Um, and pretty much how to read our progressive charts as well, like or and transits um, come much more into play once we understand all of these things. Once we understand what rules what, we really can start to understand astrology for what it is, and we can really put it into play and turn it into action, which is fucking cool, uh, in my opinion. Okay, so House One ruled by Mars, the planet Mars and rule by Aries. So obviously, and rules the first house, all right? So for a lot of people, this is our ascendant sign as well. This is what rules the eye, what rules the self, what rules the face, what rules the body, how people perceive us before they meet us, all right? So how we interpret our ascendant is a lot of the time how we will interpret our first house. Our first house is really all about the identity and it is all about the self. It's not about the other person. This is purely like it's a selfish house. It is very like if we have Venus transiting our first house, for an example, uh, you know, we're really we, maybe we might get a makeover in that time, or we might change our appearance or dye our hair or something. Something as minor as that, but just to give you an understanding about the uh, the first house, how it can play out during transits and things like things like that, you know, um, it's really about the eye, everything to do with the body and the surface. It's nothing beneath the surface. It's this very egotistical house. It's about our will and our drive. You know, if you're Aries in the first house, you probably come off really athletic, really stubborn, like really like in everyone's faces, not afraid to say what you feel. You think, I mean, uh, you say before you act type of thing. It's, um, so look to the sign that you have in your first house and that'll make you figure out the energy of how people see you and how people uh, get an impression of you when they first meet you. So it's a pretty interesting house. It really, really, really rules our physical appearance because it is the physical body. So remember that Mars, Aries, first house, first area of life, um, great house, interesting house, but it really is about the self and nothing else. The second house, this is when we come into our sharing aspect. So the second house rules is ruled by Taurus and ruled by Venus. And the second house rules the area of life of sharing and caring and wanting to share with another person and bring another person into our materialistic value. It also rules our materialistic value because this is when we're coming into Venus. So when we look at Venus, we I do know that two signs rule Venus being Libra and Taurus. So Taurus is the more materialistic, stubborn side of Venus, but it's still willing to share because Venus is all about the love and always about the other and always about a giving sense, whether it be emotional value or materialistic value. But I will say that in the second house, it is much more about the materialistic value. It's about, it's about you know, the things we buy for maybe our home that make us feel good, or we bought our first laptop and we want to share it with our significant other or, you know... Um, it's also small amounts of money, like pocket money, you know, maybe my work just gave me like a $750 COVID package or something. Like it can be anything like that. Um, it's definitely not large amounts of money. That is more of an eighth house thing, which I'll get to as I'm circling around um, this 12th house playground. But yeah, uh, but it can really be a house about sharing. It's about our values as well. It's about how much we value ourselves. So whether it's the first house is like our physical body and how people see us, the second house is about how we see each other inside and how we can really think about each other in the sense of 
okay, do I have self-confidence? Do I feel good in my own body? Um, and planets here and squares here and things like that will sort of interpret the fact of how you feel about yourself on the inside. Um, you know, if you look at yourself and you think, oh God, I hate my face, I hate the way I look, I, I don't value myself. Oh, well, like this will come out in the second house a lot if you have like some aspects playing out in that or what house you have playing out in that as well can take some effect too about how you value yourself. Uh, I'll leave it there for that one. If anyone has any questions on the houses as well, please feel free to inbox. So the third house is ruled by Gemini, um, ruled by the planet Mercury. Okay, so, and it's ruled by the third house of communication. All right, so Gemini, Mercury, communication. All right, this is how we learn our houses. This is like what pumps me up about astrology. All right, so the third house of communication is really about, it's like the short trips, like short train wide train rides we take from suburb to suburb like oh okay like i live in australia i'm from the shire originally so let's say uh we've got Sutherland to cronulla all right which is about five suburbs away and today i'm gonna wake up and i've got to go to work and i wake up in Sutherland and i've got to travel to cronulla every morning this is my short trip in my third house do you know what i mean uh, and this is what the third house relates to it relates to short trips and maybe vacationing not too far from home taking a small weekend away and it also uh, relates to our day-to-day -day connections and and whatever sign it is in your house whether you have planets in there or not it will relate to how you communicate with other people as well on a day-to-day -day basis how you express yourself how you might um speak out loud will come into play there as well just a tiny bit and um especially if your mercury is in there that, which always affects your voice your mercury placement and always look to your third house about how your voice might play out as well and combine that with your mercury placement and where your mercury placement is so that's really really cool um how we relate to other people via communication how we relate to our rational thinking you know for example i have sat in there um and it squares a lot of my things um people that have sat in the third house might really struggle with the learning to drive you know like i'm a really bad driver i just can't wrap my head around it i can't wrap around like my short trips and because it squares everything so driving makes me paranoid and maybe it's something i'll learn a little bit later in life but uh, you know, if you have like a really strong Mars in the third house, uh, maybe you might be a great driver, but uh, maybe some of the things that you say might rub people the wrong way because Mars is, you know, a very aggressive planet to have in the third house. So we've got to think about what's in there, but that's how we can relate to the third house. Okay, so the fourth house in astrology relates to our home and family. Our roots, like, you know, our sensitive feelings, our deep feelings, the things that we keep inside away from the public because what is the fourth house you know what what is it opposite it's opposite the ic i mean sorry it's opposite the mc which is our career and like everything that we put out there everything that we put out on the table you know being a celebrity and blah 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 so the fourth house is really about those roots and about that family okay so the fourth house is ruled by the moon this is where all of our emotions are and it's ruled by cancer okay so you know we think cancer we think oh the hermit someone that wants to stay home all the time and that's really what it is about it's about our safety net and it's about what we feel comfortable it's about the mother you know like whatever sign you have in the fourth house is how maybe family was while you were growing out up like i have the fourth house in aries so for me like family growing up was you know quite aggressive i'm very sporadic very all over the place very quick thinking very high driven, very energetic, um, super like um, radically and neurotically emotional because Aries doesn't take a lot of time to think. So look at what sign, if you have Pisces in there, you know it's gonna be like a little bit of maybe like a Neptunian because Neptune rules Pisces, Neptunian dreamy sanctuary, you know, you, you gotta look at um, how the home was. And that's really what it's about, but it's also about a safety net. And this is uh, what we need to feel safe and comfortable, you know, in our lives. Like, that's what the fourth house is all about, you know. Um, it's it's what we keep to ourselves. It's what we keep away from. It's what people see in the private eye. All right. So moving on to the fifth house. The fifth house is um, our romantic values, our our uh, leisurely activities, our children, the children that we might have, uh, or that we never have. Uh, our dating life and our creativity so it's ruled by leo okay and it's ruled by the sun so this is a super identifying house okay because the sun is obviously you know the, the biggest part of our solar system so the fifth house is it should be and 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 always should be no matter what shot you have an important thing 
Um, it rules, like a certain aspect of your identity, whether you have planets in there or not. Um, this is the way you act in your romantic life. This is the way you act in your dating realm. So look to the sign that you have in your fifth house and think, hey, how does that play out? Whether you have planets in there or not, the sign still plays out because that is, uh, you know, the area of life that you have in that placement of life. So, you know, this can be a really important and exciting thing. Um, you know, for example, if you had Leo, like, which is, uh, Leo is naturally in the fifth house, you know, because this is ruled by the sun, and you might be really ego egotistical about your creativity, and you might really shine in your creativity, people notice you when you have Leo in the fifth house, you know, because that's where it's meant to be, so therefore it's amplified. Um, for example, if you're an Aries descendant, you're going to have Leo in the fifth house because that's where everything is supposed to be. Aries Ascendants always have like this weird advantage of life where they just some kind of, they somehow kind of make it because every planet uh, and every sign is comfortable where they are. It's really funny like that, depending on all the aspects and everything, but I have seen it play out that way with Aries Ascendants. Um, also, you can really tell what kind of children you're gonna have. Like for example, if you have um, Black Moon Lilith in the fifth house, it might mean that you uh, might really struggle uh, within a relationship with your child. Um, and have a bad relationship with the child but they won't appreciate you and they think that you're like a bad mother and you just have this rebellious relationship with the child because Lilith rules that dark sexual rebel so you might have a really rebellious child that you can't control you know so um, look to the planets you have in the fifth house if you have any and you can kind of see what children you might have and how that might play out uh, anyway moving on from that and also that will affect your creativity as well I do see a lot of people that have a, a high amount of fifth house placements are usually highly creative. You know, they paint, they spray paint, um, they do graphic design. Or there's something to do with that. They usually have some kind of quirky aspect within their life. Moving on to the sixth house, uh, this is about our health, our jobs, our work. You know, um, this is Virgo. All right, this is ruled by Virgo, uh, and it's ruled by Mercury as well. Also ruled by the third house. So Gemini is the communicator. The communicative part of mercury and the how do i put it the more practical analytical categorizing sign of mercury is virgo okay this is where we analyze this is where we put our day-to-day -day life together this is where we want to point form and set appointments and and make sure we're at work on time and make sure uh, we, we drive to here to get here on time these are our daily life activities it's not like our short trips and communications it's not as um, sporadic as that where it's a little bit more unpredictable virgo is extremely predictable the, the, virgo is a sign that wants to analyze that wants to predict and wants to know what's going to happen okay they're going to put everything into place before it happens to make sure it works well so this is what the sixth house is all about. So, I mean, let's say for example, maybe you have Pisces in the sixth house. You're probably gonna have a really dreamy, off topic, all over the place, kind of whatever. I'm living in a dream fantasy land kind of daily life. All right, but if we have Virgo here, which is what is meant to be in the sixth house, you know, we're gonna be really analytical about our health. We're gonna care about it. We're gonna put in the effort. We're gonna jot down what we ate that day, like blah blah blah. Like maybe not that intense, but Virgo can be that intense if we're a full blown, well aspected Virgo. Virgo, Virgo. Um, that's how it's gonna play out. All right. So Virgo is a really analytical sign, and day to day life we need to be analytical. We need to set point point forms, we need to set appointments, we need to know what we're doing, we need to plan our day-to-day -day life. It's your day-to-day -day routine and how you express that day-to-day -day routine. That's what the six house is all about. So whatever sign you have in your six house is how you express your day-to-day -day life, which is super exciting. It's a good way to see how you might play out within your day-to-day -day work life, how you how you might go at your job, how you express yourself in your work life, how your work life might see you. Um, okay, moving on to the seventh house. Okay, so the seventh house, everyone wants to know about the seventh house, right? Because it's one to one relationships, business transactions, uh, marriage. Um, it's more of those like serious established relationships that we form on a day to day basis. Okay, so that's why the sixth house comes before. So these are the ones that we form on a day to day basis that are a little bit more personal than just a day to day basis. That's how we can look at it. It goes around like a clock, the twelfth house wheel. So the seventh house telling, sorry, the seventh house is ruled by Libra and ruled by Venus. And as I said before, the second house is also ruled by Taurus. 
and rule by Venus. So in the second house, we have the more materialistic values um, that comes with Taurus and that comes with, you know, our self inner worth. All right. In the seventh house, it's our self worth when it comes to other people and how people place worth on us in a one to one relationship. That's kind of how the seventh house plays out. So whatever sign that if it's not Libra, which is meant to be in the seventh house, but if you don't have Libra in your seventh house, which depending on your ascendant sign will establish your seventh house, um, you know, that's how you relate to your one to one relationships, your business transactions, and your kind of like more personal valued life. It's kind of how you might manipulate people a little bit more under behind the scenes. Not in, not entirely behind the scenes, but I do see a lot of the seventh house stelliums um, have this ability to manipulate people because they create this balance within their business transactions and their personal relationships that they kind of just know how to work people. The seventh house is how we know how to work people and how to make shit fly, all right? Especially when it comes to the business world and personal relationships. We kind of know how to create that balance, especially if we have planets in there that have good aspects, okay? So it really just works in the seventh house. Um, I have seen some really successful people have seven past sun, seven past Jupiter, like just whack shit that just works out. Um, but it really can tell us what our marriage is going to be like, the kind of person that we're attracted to in our one to one relationships, the kind of people that we want to commit to, the kind of people we want to put effort into on a one to one relationship that we want to get really personal with. You know, like, uh, for example, I have it in Cancer. I'm really attracted to Cancers. I just, they drawn to me. My brother's a Cancer as well. I have, I obviously have a superb one-to-one -one relationship with him. Do you know what I mean? They're more of our long-term relationships that we establish things with. So the seventh house is, um, and same with business transactions and business relationships as well. Partnerships, any kind of partnership, long-term partnership that you're thinking about. You know, look to Kansas, see how it's aspected, see how it might play out, see what you need from that. That's how we understand the seventh house. Also, see where your Venus is, see where Libra is placed. That's how we can work out what we need from that entirely, if we want to go a little deep. All right, moving on to the eighth house. And obviously, the eighth house, oh, we God, we all love that, right? Okay, so it's ruled by Pluto um, and ruled by Scorpio. So, I really do believe that Pluto is a huge generational thing, obviously, because it takes, I don't know, 280 years to cycle around the whole zodiac sign. So it spends a lot of time in one sign, and it's a big deal, right? Right now, Pluto is in Capricorn, so blah, let's deal with that. But for the time being, Pluto in... Uh, in being anything in the 8th house can bring out a lot of things in someone. The 8th house is the area of life uh, that depth of our subconscious, our subconscious thinking that we can't always control, our anxieties, our depression, our sadness, our tears, our really deep feelings, uh, our vulnerability, you know, it, it's the mental health region of our life, you know, it also represents death, either death of a loved one or death of ourselves. Um, and I don't like to get into death too much, but if you have Venus in the 8th house and it's well aspected, you're probably going to have a really peaceful death. It's just a fact. They're obviously depending on everything, but I have seen it play out that way with Venus in the 8th house. And I don't like to predict death in astrology, but you can if you really want it. But I'm not saying let's all run and go get into that right now. But Venus in the 8th, uh, sorry, 8th house in general can also represent taxes. Uh, losing large amounts of money. Like I said, the second house, which is opposite the eighth house, the second house rules small amounts of money, right? Pocket money. The eighth house rules large amounts of money, all right? It's like winning the lottery, um, losing an in, in, insurmountable worth of debt to the government. You know, it's government money. It is shit that you really don't want to pay if it's badly aspected. If it's badly aspected, you might need to be careful about where you're putting your money because you're most likely going to get some hard hit transits to that. Or maybe that's just how it's natally going to play out for you. So therefore, you should really watch where you're putting your savings. You, maybe you need to save more and focus on that more and pay attention more to where you're putting your money. Um, and the same for a badly aspected 8th house selling can be a dangerous thing as well where we don't care about our health 
our mental health, not our health, because our health rules our sixth house. Our mental health in the eighth house rules our mind and our subconscious, where we need to take, maybe you might uh, party too much, and or maybe you have minor psychosis and you're not um, taking care of it. Maybe you have bipolar, maybe you have depression, maybe you have anxiety. You know, this is where all of this, these things in the eighth house can play out. Maybe you need to eat heaps because, um, you know, it's a comfort food thing. Maybe you're a shopaholic and you spend a lot of money on, on things that you don't need to fill a void in you. Maybe you're a hoarder and you have heaps of things to fill a void in you. So this is where uh, the eighth house can get a little bit dark, but the eighth house can also be extremely spiritual, extremely esoterical. I know a lot of astrologers with many placements in the eighth house and they're the best spiritual readers I know. Um, so, and the eighth house can also be an in-depth creativity, um, you know, uh, doing art for counseling. I've seen it play out like that as well. So it does have a lot of like, um, you know, awesome topics where, you know, we can get really creative in the eighth house. I mean, Scorpio is all about depth, but it's also about worrying and revenge and needing to feel like we're worth something is what Pluto is really pushing for and Scorpio is pushing for. So whatever sign you have in the eighth house, look to that sign, look to what it needs if you're struggling with mental health issues, all right? Look at what aspect it's making to your houses and think, hey, you know what? I really uh, I really need to take care of my mental health and this is how I'm gonna go about it. Because to be on an eighth house, if, if you're an eighth house telling me as well, I always see that play out in like people's style as well. They get this real punky, like real cool kind of style about them sometimes or or they lock themselves in their rooms and they never come out it, it can go either way they're either super like scorpion eccentric or they're either real quiet and locked away so depends on everything that's the eighth house moving on to the ninth house of sagittarius ruled by jupiter all right so this is about all about our expansion and our optimism and our excitement okay um this is our higher education this is our knowledge this is our you know, when you read a book and you remember it and you put it in your mind, it's probably, you know, you go about that in whatever sign your ninth house is in, all right? This is how you go about your education. This is how you go about your travel. Maybe the types of countries that you travel to, travel to have a real, um, I don't know, Gemini feel. They're all like kind of wishy-washy and sporadic, but you have great banter when you go there more than you're at home, or maybe they're really areas where there's heaps of adventure and adrenaline and excitement and you're running and you're cycling. So, you know, like whatever your, your sign is, is in your ninth house is, you know, how you go about learning, how you go about putting that learning knowledge into your brain, you know, how you take in knowledge, how you educate yourself, what kind of school you want to go to might play out in what sign or planets you have in your ninth house because this is our optimism and our expansion. This is how we go about our optimism and our education, right? So this is how we can look at the ninth house. It's a fun house. It's, a, it's, a, it's not so much a sporadic house, but it's a knowledgeable house and it's an optimistic house. It's where we might like to have fun outside of ourselves because every, every, every house from one to seven is in the inner quarters of the astrological astrological birth chart all right so whatever we have from the 8th to the 12th now we're getting into the outer world now we're getting into the you know the expansion of ourselves it's not just about us anymore all right so from 1 to 7 is about us and from 8 to 12 is about others and about bigger something bigger than ourselves something we're going to teach ourselves that's bigger than ourselves and that's what the ninth house is all about teaching ourselves something more than what we're worth giving ourselves knowledge, giving ourselves power, giving ourselves the education to eventually move forward to the 10th house, right? Okay, so when we get to the 10th house, this is ruled by Saturn. This is when we start getting real serious about the fun and the knowledge and maybe the uni student vibe that we might have had. This is just how, you know, this is just an interpretation of how we work around the wheel, all right? So Saturn rules the 10th house. Capricorn rules the 10th house, and the 10th house rules our destiny, our career, our outer goal motivation, right? Our seriousness in the public eye, how we want to be perceived, how we want people to see us on maybe a social media level a little bit more. Maybe, uh, you know, we, we can combine the 11th house with the social media as well, but it's a little bit different. Social media, LinkedIn, 
LinkedIn. I don't know if you guys know, I mean, you know that's how you fucking say it. I'm not a LinkedIn fan, but LinkedIn is a huge career, is a huge tenth house sat in Capricorn thing. It's serious. It's where business people can be on social media and be serious. Okay? It's a, you're established when you're on LinkedIn. You, you have your profile. It's how you can get jobs. It's how you can recommend people to other people and blah, 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 blah. It's how we can all get to know each other. Um, but this is where we can really establish our ambitions in the 10th house and where we want to work on our career and how we might go about working our career. So whatever sign you have in your 10th house is how you're gonna, you gonna might go about your career. And if you have plans there, it might be how you work, work on your career. For example, my friend is a Libra, 10th house. She is a 10th house stellium. She has Sun, Moon, Venus, and Jupiter there. She's, of course, having Venus there, she's in Libra. She's extremely ben Venetian when it comes to her career. She's a photographer for Colette by Colette Heyman. And she's very creative and she has a very, very good career that she worked very hard for. But it almost just kind of like fell into her lap. But not to say that she didn't have the talent in the first place, she was always creative, but it just kind of fell there because she had those planets there to support that consistent creative basis for her. Um, and you can really figure out what direction you need to go in career-wise um, via your astrology chart. I really, really do believe that. It can really give some insight, especially transits too. Transits will always give you a hint of where you need to go. But the 10th house is, to me, is very, it's our ambition. It's where we're career orientated and it's where we can kind of get a little bit serious about life and what we really kind of value and how we want to portray ourselves to our career media, not our social media. That's not our friend media, but like our social business media, which is why I think LinkedIn in my head. All right, so I'm going to move forward. I'm going to go to the 11th house. Uh, the other house is one of my favorites, ruled, ruled by Uranus and ruled by Aquarius. So straight away, obviously, we're thinking eccentricities here. But Uranus is all about friendships. It's about lacking that pressure uh, of putting it onto somebody else. We shouldn't do that. It's not okay. You know, and Aquarius is all about um, forward future thinking, starting something new, creating something beneficial for the human environment and for our community and for our human race. Um, so when we think 11th house, we think, um, this is when we start getting, uh, you know, we've got our ambitions and shit in the 10th house, but this is where we have our dreams. This is where we have our excitement. This is where we have those fun nights when we go out in the town and we paint it red. You know, this is where we have our ups and our downs in our community where we think everything is swinging and oh my God, then it's not. And then it is again. So this is where I think can get really whack. You know, the 11th house is a very broad spectrum because the further we get away from the first house to the seventh house, which is all about us and all about, you know, normal shit, all right, the 11th house is just before the 12th. So I'm not surprised that Uranus rules the 11th house because, of course, it's going to be whack, right? It's so whack. It makes no sense. This is where we get really creative. This is where the weird get to be the weird. This is where the... You know, we're just starting to be the unknown, but we're not quite there yet. We're just pushing society's boundaries in the 11th house, okay? This is where things get not completely unknown like the 12th, but they can be unknown enough to be weird. Where everyone's like, what the fuck? I did not see that coming. That is what the 11th house is all about. You have a lot of planets in the 11th house. You might be a really eccentric being. You might be extremely, like, wackily creative. You might dress real weird. You might have these whack dreams that no one else has even thought about before, and you're super excited about them. You might really want to be a part of community and be super active in your community and, and make that change for the people around you because you're not just about yourself when you're in the 11th house. It's not about the self. It is about our community and others, not close friends, not family. Family is about fourth house, Okay. One-to-one -one relationships is about the seventh, and the first house is about the eye. But the eleventh house is seriously about a community. It's about the world. It's about climate change. It's about like the bigger things that we really need to care about. You know, it's about protesting. It's about coming together as a community to make a difference. It's about coming together to scare the community to make a difference. It's about being wacky and weird to create a change. So that's why the 11th house can be really cool. So I'm not surprised it's ruled by Aquarius and it's ruled by Uranus because Uranus is the highly, most highly tilted planet that we have in our solar system. So therefore, why not? Let's get wacky. Um, okay, so moving on to our last 
house, which I'm super excited about. And I'm so glad I finally did this video. And I'm, I hope you guys enjoy it because I'm feeling like it's educational in my head. Please tell me if it's not, and I can explain it better because I know I ramble a lot. So, anyway, you can watch my 12th house selling video where I do tap on the 12th house. But it is really, um, how do I put it? It's really, uh, you know, it's just really, um, I say arm a lot. It's my first YouTube video ever, so it's probably not the greatest. So I'm going to tap into that 12th house video. And, uh, so 12th house meaning now. All right. So the 12th house is ruled by Neptune and ruled by Pisces. All right. Who was a Pisces star? I mean, we can think of those things. Coco Bay. Super emotional. But he was in the 4th house of Cancer. But we can still relate it of that watery nature that he had. Super dreamy. Substance abuse. Um, getting stuck in the unknown, not knowing how to deal with the public, not knowing how to get out and express himself in the right way, okay? Or as best that he could. He was never seen. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, okay, had Neptune in the first house. No one ever saw her for the person that she wanted to be seen as. She was a mirage. She was a fantasy, all right? The Twelfth house is about fantasy illusion. And yes, we can go into the part where it rules asylums and hospitals and things like that. I'm not doubting that it cannot rule that today. But all I'm saying is in general, in a context, that it can really rule that fantasy side of us. Which is why Pisces can be so creative. Because we think outside of this box that doesn't really exist on a day-to-day -day plane. And this is where the 12th house can get really exciting. It is the unknown. The 12th house can play out in many ways. It just depends on how the individual chooses to analyze their 12th house and bring it to the table. If you have planets there, obviously you're going to have a better time of um, understanding your nature and understanding your 12th house placement. But I know a lot of 12th house placements that just have struggled to know they are. And procrastination is a huge level of the 12th house. But once we get past that procrastination, which usually comes with older age because 12th house likes Saturn, so, which is funny, the Saturn and, and, and 12th house is the only two things that I will really say are late bloomers. The 12th house really can bloom up to 30 because we have that maturity to be able to make decisions because we have to. If Pisces and 12th houses aren't pushed into a decision, they won't do it. But when they get to a certain age, you know, especially in Western culture, we all feel that we're pushed into this decision to step forth and do something with our lives. So this is where a 12th house can really kind of come to play. They're also great at spirituality, the higher plane, um, just living on a higher frequency in a projective nature if aspected well, and knowing how to deal with it. The 12th house is all about knowing how to deal with it. it it's all about breaking that loop cycle that you might have. Uh, if you have bad karma, you will repeat it again and again in the 12th house. Pretty much it's all about just breaking that. So look to where it's about, it's okay. So like the eighth house, right, is is about our subconscious thinking. It's about our fears. It's about our mental illnesses. So times your eighth house by a thousand. This is the deep shit that we don't even know how to access. It's that a psychologist can't access. It's that a counselor can't access. It's what our meds can't access if we have any. All right, just for an example. It's about the shit that's so deep down that we can't even speak to ourselves about it, that we don't even understand, that we don't even know is there within ourselves. It could be a talent that we didn't even know we had, and then we turned 30, and then all of a sudden we have it. Even though it's in the background, we always help out in the background. The 12th house is what you can do behind the scenes. It's how you can create behind the scenes. It's how you can be something behind the scenes that nobody else could have before. It's the behind the scenes surprise factor. It is the kinder surprise. Something that you didn't know was there. All right. Let's give it like a real simple example. Okay. As you look at me now, you think, oh man, this chick's got no tits. She got no titties at all. Uh, maybe I always go out and I wear bag, baggy t shirts and you don't see them. And then I wear this tight top and I'm like, bitch, I got tits. You know? And then the guy takes my shirt off and he goes, wow. Like that before, and it's just for a really, really small um, 
it gets a sickle example of it, but sometimes it's four is really hard to break down. I feel like that's the easiest way to do it. It's the unseen. And we just need to learn how to see it. That's all it is. So I'm gonna leave those four houses there. And I thought you, I, I really hope you enjoyed it because I put a lot of effort into that and I really enjoyed actually doing it as well because learning the 12 houses is like literally such a good thing. And if you understand them as properly as I do, I mean, you can pretty much read anything from there when you really get the hang of it. So please like and subscribe. It means the world to me and thank you. That's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. <laughs>